personally, over the last few years, I've noticed um, a, a change in the community, and, and it's much for the better. Ron has started to be invited to all kinds of events. He's been traveling the country. He has been um, receiving the spotlight that is long overdue. So, Ron, how does it feel to, to finally be pulled in and invited and embraced, and you know, to get to travel the country on, on the you know on the front of the fans? It, it's the first for me. This is my second year doing conventions and. Uh, it, I know, I'm feeling really great. My wife retired a couple of years ago, so we're both traveling and we're going to different parts of the country and meeting a lot of fans and just having a, a, a good time, you know, talking with everybody. Uh, yeah, I, this is probably my third convention this year. Uh, I've got two more in, in the fall, in September. Uh, one in Tennessee and one in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, that'll be it for me here for me. And uh, well, we're having a good time. And, uh, and uh, really enjoy it. I hope to get to go to some other cons and some other places to see what the country is. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I've been thrilled to see it. The photos always look like you're having a good time, and I always see people posting about how it, um, you know, it's a, it's a lifelong goal or dream for us that played with this stuff growing up to meet you guys in person, Kirk and Ron. You guys think, I'm sure it was just a job, but you literally touched millions of people. Um, so well, we're, well, it wasn't a job. That's... You got a <laughs> 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 so We worked hard, yep. and... Uh, you know, we, we got the job done, we worked as a team, and uh, it's not just one person running the whole joke team, it was everybody, yep. you know, and uh, I give a lot of credit to the other guys on the team, and, and uh, I was just a, kind of a small part of it, but I was probably the lucky one where I did figures, where everyone else did vehicles and things like that. So... You say that, and, and the common perception for Ron, for those that don't have a, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what you did on the brand. He was there since the beginning, since before the beginning of Real American Hero. He did some sticker sheets for Super Joe, right? And uh, the 12 inch stuff. He yeah, some, did some, some, some artwork. For, did so. so, pre three and three quarter inch stuff. Thank you. He also did some, some work on sticker sheets and pre, for previous lines of G.I. Joe. Now, he was there from the very beginning of the Real American Hero. And common misperception is that, is that you know he left in '86. Sure, he did. He went and worked on some other brands, but he came back in and still did some artwork for the 1994 line. So he is one of those designers that actually touched on the brand from the beginning to the end of a real American hero. So I think that's really cool. But beyond designing every single figure from 1982 to 1986 and some of '87, he also designed some of my bar like bar none favorite vehicles. My favorite vehicle is the Thunder Machine. Uh, inspired by Mad Max and the Thunderdome. Yeah. I absolutely love that vehicle. My neighbor had one. I could never find it, so I just always had a vehicle in me. And that came from Ron Rudat, in addition to the Fang, the, the Pack Rats. Right. The Fang is the helicopter that yeah. James Bond, right? Yeah. Um, kind of rats, like the the Moray. The Moray is probably Moray. the biggest one that, the biggest vehicle you did. Yeah. I designed the Moray and uh, did a, a full scale drawing by hand. I still have the drawing all framed up at home. Uh, Mr. Don Luca, who was my, later my boss, um, built the Mare, uh, the hull of it anyway, because that's basically what he does in the castle on the boat or, and out in uh, Rhode Island. But he, uh, he came in and uh, eventually became our boss. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I work on some uh, smaller vehicles, you know, the, the Dreadnought uh, motorcycle as well. Can't think of any other ones. I know there are a couple of the smaller vehicles. Like triple T. Triple T, yeah. They're kind of triple T. So what was your personal favorite vehicle? Moray. Moray and why? It is a beautiful book. <laughs> <laughs> the Moray basically came from me watching uh, um, Miami Vice and the, and the cigarette boats that they were driving. And that's basically where that came from. 
that I just had in other uh, cards were on that boat. So let's start off with the process. He's best known for figure design, obviously, because he designed every single figure for five or six years. So what was the process like? I know you and Kirk worked hand in hand, and Kirk was the brand manager at the time in the early 80s, and later he was vice president of Boys Toys. So what was the process like? Just kind of a brief overview. You can go as deep as you'd like to, but we'll try to hold up some sketches here and drawings to kind of... Well, the process, it, it ranges... Um, we would have a brainstorm meeting, you know, the, uh, the Joe team, and we would uh, have talk about different scenarios for figures and what have you. I would write down a list of some of those scenarios and, and uh, go back to my desk and just start cranking uh, on figure drawing. It didn't have to be like super detailed or anything like that. I just had to, you know, get the idea across that this is what I want the figure to look like. And uh, I, I, I put the plaster all over the wall and in our uh, brainstorm room, and uh, Kurt would come in with a, I don't know, another marketing person and uh, they can choose what they want them to see. You know, uh, they say, I want the boots on this guy or on that guy, or I want the, this weapon on that guy, or the head change, or something like that. And once they decided what they wanted for a figure, I'd go back and uh, take all those ideas that they suggested and I'd make a final drawing of, of the figure. So here's some. So do you kit back? Yeah. You know, yeah, these are some, some of the drawings that I, I worked on. Uh, you know, they're real quick. Sometimes, you, you, I don't know, it goes by so fast just, you know, coming up with these ideas because I could do eight, eight ideas in a day or nine ideas in a day. And, uh, and then I move on to the next figure. And, but, uh, I was on a schedule. I had, uh, uh, besides the main line of figures to do, I had the drivers to do as well. Uh, so in the end, there were probably uh, 12, 14 figures a year, something like that. So here's an example of where Kirk liked the entire eel design, except for the head. Entire head. Our entire figure, not head, right, read it, marked out. And it actually looks like the Televiper head that we got a few years later. So it looks like Ron was able to slide that idea in later <laughs> and get it past the current barricade. It was, just wasn't right for this year. That's just not for that figure. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't match with the head just wasn't diver. right for this year. <laughs> <laughs> for, not for an underwater figure, right? So uh, this is a detailed sketch for scrap iron. So he's going through and doing different head profiles for scrap iron. One of the things that I find interesting is in the lure of that figure, um, you know, in the cartoon and comic book and stuff, he's, he's got the scarred face, but the actual toy itself didn't have that detail. Well, that detail was on Ron's early sketch, so I thought that was interesting. Um, so Ron was just mentioning once he got done with the figure design, he would create the uh, kind of polished pencil design. We'll come back to that in just a second, because that's out of order with my slides. <laughs> Here, um, so, this, well, a so these are the preliminaries for uh, Firefly. Yeah. And then eventually he would make a final tight rendering to have all the detail of himself, <coughs> which then later turned into a presentation art that you did as well yeah. after this, so it lost the final pencil. I think it was the first couple of years I would do uh, presentation art. Uh, I would do the presentation art. And then uh, um, I, I, paint mini I painted miniatures at the time, you know, historical miniatures. And uh, I went to a show for a uh, manager, and I met uh, a guy there named Dave Dorman. I got Dave Dorman to come into Hasbro and do some presentation art. I was getting so far now doing all the uh, other work, uh, sculptural input and colors and costing and you know, all kinds of other things, that I didn't have time to do presentation art. So we hired these guys like Dave Dorman to to do the presentation art. So here's an example of the early presentation art. This is for Ace, the pilot for the Sky Striker, and I think Kirk let me shoot this, so thank you. Um, you yeah. know, basically Ron did this while he had time, but the line exploded. So they started kind of conservative in 1982 with kind of the minimal color palette and the reuse of different uh, figure parts, heads, and so on. 
But by 1983, the line was a raging success, and they were able to just carte blanche, go crazy, and you know, really design to their heart's content. But they also produced a lot more figures as the line went on, and so Ron had to kind of, you know, rescind these duties or delegate these duties to other people like Dave Dorman. So um, one thing that we kind of glossed over was the uh, the color study stuff. Do we have any color studies here? So once once Ron would create that uh, more polished uh, pencil drawing of the of the figure, and it was approved, it got through the Kirk. Um, gauntlet, then he would start working through color palettes. And so that's an example of Leatherneck, and that's actually the one that got picked, right? And Dusty. So, how many color studies would you do for a particular character? Was there a set number, or was it just kind of just made to set number. It's whenever I felt like doing uh, I, I normally did about eight to ten color studies for each figure. And was that still just you and Kurt working hand in hand for the process? Yeah, it was me and Kurt. Uh, I don't recall anyone else that. Troopus probably was in our machines. When you were the brand manager, the brand, uh, I don't know who was in charge of the art department at that time. Bonnie. Uh, yeah, uh, Steve Breeze. Uh, Steve Breeze. Uh, uh, Wayne, Wayne Luther might have been. Wayne Luther, Wayne Luther at the beginning. Yeah. So, so this is one character, uh, this is Lamprey, that was the, uh, the pilot of your awesome boat, Moray. Yeah. And uh, we've got just right here, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, <laughs> no, 12 color studies that he did for Lamprey. And then once they arrived at the kind of blue and silver or blue and white, um, then that, that was selected. From there, so he's already done dozens of sketches and had things marked out and recombined things, and then he's created the final kind of sketch art. Then he's created the color studies that were made on photocopies of the final sketch art. Now you got to go to presentation art, which is like the ace one that we just showed you, because you got to sell that through to management, right? Yeah. So this is Lamprey that was selected, and then this is the Lamprey presentation art, and this is courtesy of Dan. Do you know who drew that? That's Ron? That's you? Yeah, you yeah. Right? It's the same pose. That's what I found interesting about this. So the loose sketch that they used for the color study, it's the same pose for the presentation art. It could have been um, Andre Krabonics and possibly. Okay. For the year, that year, I, I think some of the stuff was on face. So, so that, that's presentation art. And so a couple quick slides right here. Here's Ron's rough sketches. Here's presentation art. This was done by George Woodbridge, who was another, he was an external contractor, right, that was doing a... Uh, yep. Yeah, I'll do the presentation George, art. George Woodbridge. George Woodbridge is an amazing illustrator. Some of the uh, presentation art for his character is just absolutely yeah. gorgeous. George Woodbridge was a, a, a guy who worked for Mad Magazine at, at the time. And also, he, because I was in the American Civil War and I was a reenactor of Civil War, uh, he did a series of books for the, uh, the hit military historian. It's, it's a well known group. In, in the country, who studies American history and and soldiering and whatever. Well, he did all the illustrations in those books. The man's amazing. He truly is. Uh, this is another Woodbridge, the Snow Serpent one. I actually got this from Ron when I went up to visit him maybe five years ago. I swore I wasn't going to buy anything when I went in because I wasn't a pre-production collector. <coughs> and we sat there for five hours and talked. And by the time I left, he was like, "Here, take this, take this, have this." And I, I did pay him, but he, he was, it was. When you walk through Ron's paperwork with him in his art studio, you, you don't read it. Than I, do. <laughs> <laughs> so, I couldn't remember names or anything like that. Yeah. He told me every one of them. So here's a loose sketch for Snow Serpent, just one of a dozen or so that he created. And then here's the final presentation art by George Woodbridge as well. Um, so this is, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about, Ron of course didn't just design the figures, he designed all the accessories, right? So we wanted to talk a little bit about how you found inspiration from the real world for your accessories. So this is Tripwire, and there's some photocopies of magazines yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah it's, it's basically look, looking it up and, um, you know, popular mechanics, you find uh, the future weapons are, that are coming out. Uh, all the weapons I even made up on my head, I just, you know, whatever it was. So, so this is uh, Firefly's uh, much maligned green cell phone that's always lost. You know. <laughs> Surprised there's not repros of that yet. Um, there's some ninja backpacks with swords going through them. Uh, this, is this Firefly's gun? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it looks like Firefly's gun. So he would create these kinds of illustrations. Again, go through the, revert, the review process with Kurt and company. And yeah. Once you got things approved, 
Um, did you actually, what kind of, did you have any hand-on-hand, -hand like, did you have any experience with the sculptors? Did you walk down and talk to them about it? Or I talk to the sculptors all the time. All the time. Because I admire the, the work they do. Yeah. So, you know, I would go down there. I made mean, uh, some really good friends with the sculptors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure they would have a dozen questions for you while they're building something. What was your intent? You know, what did you want to do? Well, like? Not necessarily. No? They just run with it. They would just run with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, they'd use my drawings. I, I think got them back, uh, like Bill Mernheim would say, uh, my sculptural info was probably the best info he's ever had because it was, it was really detailed. Uh, so Bill Merkheim was a well-regarded sculptor. He did everything from G.I. Joe to the Visa Dove. Um, the Visa Dove had to be sculpted at life-size scale, like the scale is going to be reproduced on the credit card. So he was an incredibly uh, detailed miniature sculptor, as well as a G.I. Joe sculptor. You guys can go to the Declassified booth and see some two-ups, which are sculpts of the figures at twice the scale that they were actually released. They sculpt them at twice the scale so they could get more detail into them. Bill was one of the guys I met when I was doing my miniatures. And, and showing my manager, I, I, that's where I met Bill, because he would do figures in one-to-one -one that size and, and super detailed. If you guys look on YouTube for Bill Markline and Gary Head, Gary Head went and did interviews with Bill, and they're all posted online, and they're amazing. So go in, and there's lots of insight on G.I. Joe in there. So this is a Tripwire, and there's a, there's a magazine photocopy right here with almost an identical... Uh, mind detector right there. So you can see where Ron was, you know, kind of again looking in the real world and finding inspiration. Ron did the uh, presentation art for Tripwire right here, so that's another example of um, the final artwork that would be presented through to management to get buy-in. This is after Kirk. Who would you, who would you guys have been produ uh, presenting to with this presentation art? Toys R Us. Oh. Really? Walmart, Target. Okay. Yeah, all our major customers. I always had in my head that like this was for Prupus or other kind of People at Hasbro. This yeah. was for Toys R Us. Toys R Us. Yeah, We'd use it for management. Yeah. 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 yeah, but but but. But yeah. you would also show this to retailers. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so I never. Knew I mean, that. that's what it was done for was for the retailers. Great. But eventually, we shown. I mean, obviously, we'd be shown to management to get keep them up to yeah. up to speed on what yeah. we were doing. So these are the engineering drawings that Ron was talking about, where he was the best of the best with the input drawings. Um, this is Lamprey once again, which wanted to do a kind of common theme with this presentation, showing a lot of the more. Um, but again, you guys send me an email and I'll send you uh, a link to this presentation. So one of the things that's fun for us nerds that really get into this stuff with you guys is to find little historical tidbits. And so one of the things I got from Ron was two sculpt sheets for Snow Serpent, and the original Snow Serpent doesn't have any of the parachute pack harness on. And so originally Ron did not intend for that to be molded into the figure. Uh, they sent a letter out, and the letter basically said, hey, uh, throw out that old drawing, use this new drawing, and then the new drawing has the harness baked into the body. So I'm assuming that the accessories you designed must have changed at the time, too. It's probably more of like a crazy legs harness that wrapped all the way around the body, and what we ended up instead was kind of a fanny pack, right? <laughs> you got the little blue parachute, and you got the little thing that connects around the back. So well, you know what you can do on the crotch, I was so, why were those typically when you had a decision like that that you're going to have a standalone parachute uh, pack and then it becomes a fanny pack? What's the kind of decision making process? Was it was it always just a uh, kind of? And Kirk, you might be able to answer this. Was it always bean counting, or was there uh, technical limitations in the you know reproduction? process of it or yeah I mean, on like that, that figure yeah. on that figure I don't know I mean it could have been could have been a combination of both yeah maybe yeah. they couldn't mold mold it the way Ron had drawn it so you know molding that onto the figure might have been a yeah, problem we felt that that harness back was done separately and it had to be top to bottom and you couldn't do any kind of size yeah, yeah. And so you can see it back and forth. There's the two uh, engineering drawings for the sculptor to use uh, without the harness and with the harness. And there's a little letter with Ron's name highlighted so you know that this was Ron's copy of the letter. So thanks for uh, always sharing this stuff with us because we find it really interesting to dig in on it. So um, beyond just doing the engineering sculpt sheet that showed the body from the various angles, they created these kind of Pantone sheets that told you exactly what colors to use. Tell me I have one. Yeah, 
So uh, go visit Ron at his desk and flip through his portfolio and you can see this kind of stuff in real life instead of on my little computer, not a projector. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, all right, so one of the things I that to say about that is people don't understand that the, 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 those sheets that I have, the control art, the color and everything, I didn't just get it. Kurt got it. Right. Orion got it. I forgot who else. Engineering. Engineering, Engineering got it. Copy. So those are the only copies around. There are no other copies. So there's only like three or four of each one? Right. Yeah. And if they're, uh, if they're in color like this with the original Pantones, that's an original, but there will be, you know, some photocopies floating around like this one. So if you're a pre-pro collector, go for these. Um, Ron also did all the insignias. Now, obviously the, base, the most famous of all of those is the Cobra Sigil, and that's everywhere. It's on movies, it's on TV commercials, it's crazy. It's on body parts. It's on body parts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he also designed all of the patches for all of the action figures that he designed. So every little detail of that figure down to the insignias. Yeah. And they're not real world insignias, right? Like you took influence from real world stuff, but you always changed it. Yeah, correct? This is sometimes, this is mercenary. Major blood. Major blood. blood. Major blood. With the robot arm, or is it a cyborg or a cybernetic arm? We always talk about it. It's one of the things us nerds obsess about. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this is an alternate Cobra logo that they were considering at the time. So, cool. yeah, there's an original Xerox copy of this, and then the one that we received, where the one that we got is cut out. And it's in another binder where the PMS color. Draw it on next to it so they knew, okay, here's the, here's the symbol we use, here's the PMS color, it's going to go off of it, and so forth. I have the original copy uh, at home. It's yeah. all framed up. Yeah. That one's not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there. Um, that was one of my favorite moments shooting oh, a photo yeah, with you yeah. in your hallway. And you can see the, the ribs on there. There's only four ribs. Yeah. Now they're. Um, a lot more than that. Yeah, a lot more than that. So, so he's got this, and he's got the moray drawings hanging in his uh, hallway at the house. The thing with these two is, is uh, people don't understand. Hey, this is done by hand. This is not computer work. This is done by hand. Yeah. Yep. And so here's the two to one scale patches that you drew, and then here's the one to one scale patches. So you know, again, kind of like they sculpted the figures at double scale, they also drew the line art at double scale, so you can scale it down and get more detail in it. Yeah. So, a lot of fun stuff. So now let's talk about vehicle design. You guys know about the figures. You might have known about the vehicles. I want you to know about the vehicles and more. So uh, let's talk a little about, about research. Where did you go to uh, do vehicle research? That picture you're showing there. Uh -huh. That's down at uh, Otis Air Force Base on Cape Cod. And uh, across from Otis Air Force Base, there's an Army National Guard base. And we went down there and we rode in the APC all around the camp. Uh, the bridge layer came from there. Yep. Um, you know, I'm not sure what other armor we used. I was sitting in the tank. Yep. Uh, yeah, all all right. That's one of my favorite photos. Fun too. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so one thing you did early on, 1982, Missile Command Headquarters. Yeah. This is uh, the original line art for that. Uh, this was a cardboard playset made specifically for Sears for the holiday season. Uh, they wanted to create a partnership with Sears to create an exclusive. They didn't have time to actually go make a plastic toy. Um, there have been some other lines that had done cardboard sets that were successful with them. I believe this was, I mean, I'm certain that with a real American hero, this is the only one. So do you guys want to talk about what was your turnaround time like for this project? you have two weeks? It was quick. Yeah? It was quick. Ron, what was that experience like? I had fun doing it. Uh, Especially with rock, you know, yeah. I enjoy that kind of thing. And it's uh, fan painting. I forgot how I did it. And uh, watercolors were acrylic. Uh, huh. And then they recently recreated it for us at San Diego Comic Con. So this was a prohibitively expensive uh, toy or playset, probably because of the fragility of the cardboard and it being a Sears exclusive. Did it for that Comic Con, and Bobby Bala. Yeah. Bobby Bala's here today. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm sure Daryl had a hand in that as well. So I, I thank you guys for to, making it affordable for us. I just again. want to correct you on what, these, what it was called. It wasn't a cardboard place. Uh, uh oh, marketing right here. Go ahead. Four color action cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> Four color action cardboard. Is there an acronym for that? 
All right, we'll figure it out later. That's what we, if you, you look at the Sears catalog, I believe that's how they Four refer color to it. it action just, card I had to write the copy for them. This is why Kirk made the big bucks, all right? <laughs> <laughs> you take a cardboard playset, make it into action cardboard. So that was the product. This is also coincidentally, you guys probably know me for being obsessed with the painted art of G.I. Joe. This was the one Real American Hero box that showed product photography on the front. There was not an original painted illustration created for this. Probably again due to the, the two-week turnaround, yeah, right? Uh, Hector Garrido and Ed Morrill that were creating packaging for them back in 81, 82 certainly wouldn't have had time to turn around a, a created a, a acrylic or a wash painting for the box art. So it got product photography and that's the one and only time that happened. Um, another thing that Ron created, and Ron, I hadn't seen these till last week, and wow, seriously, the engineering yeah. precision of these I forgot, drawings. I forgot I had done those. These are absolutely beautifully engineered drawings, so seriously, send me a message through Facebook or Twitter, I'll send you this deck. These drawings are beautiful. All three pack rats. I honestly didn't know that Ron had that kind of engineering illustrative chops. Like he's, I've seen his figure drawings, I've seen his vehicle drawings, they're all beautiful, but this stuff is like... Man, it's so precise. I'm nerding out. All right. <laughs> so these are some uh, exploration drawings for the moray. So this isn't what it ended up as, but these show you some exploratory um, looks into what a hydrofoil boat might have looked like. And then we get into the final art from an overhead perspective and the final art from a, a side perspective. Not only did he create the boat, once again, he created all the decals that go with it. This is an incredible logo or icon, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then it, here's the whole sticker sheet. So every little decal on that boat. Ron uh, put in little fun details, like his phone number on one of them. I won't broadcast that again, because somebody did call him. They found the vehicle and they called him, and I don't want to do that to him. Anybody know the great child? Oh, so now we know who did it. And the funny thing is, Gray told me he didn't answer, but Ron called back. <laughs> that shows you the kind of man that Ron is. All right, so another thing, uh, this, is my, this is a very close personal story to me, because when I went up and visited with Ron uh, four or five years ago, he had a ton of drawings, and one of the things I was able to take with me was the black and white line art for the Sky Striker tail fin. Um, I went back and uh, recreated that in Adobe Illustrator, and then I sent it out into the CD underbelly of the Joe community, and people made t-shirts from it. I didn't do it, but people made t-shirts from it. And so when you see these everywhere, that's because Ron and I had a seat in his office, and then I went home and made a little project, so that's a ton of fun. Um, we also went on to do the Night Raven one. And so Ron created all of these uh, iconic images. Like when I think of the one t-shirt that I see the most at any of these conventions is literally this Sky Striker t-shirt. It's been everywhere. So that was a ton of fun. Um, one thing that people, uh, some people don't know about Ron is that he's an accomplished painter. And this was a mail order poster that also paired with To the Rescue. To the Rescue, you guys know, because it was the 1983 catalog art, very popular image. Um, Stars and Stripes Forever was used again in 1997 for another box set of figures. This was, I think, the single most beautiful rendering of an American flag I've ever seen, and I'm not blowing smoke. It's an absolutely beautiful rendering of the American flag. How did it come around that, that you got assigned this? Because you were already busy. You were drawing yeah. all the figures. You were doing drawing. I don't really recall. Don't, but you definitely did it. It's your face. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we needed a... We, we needed, um, Post, uh, we were doing those promotions. The, right. the follow up to the Cobra Commander promotion for Flag Points was a poster promotion. Right. Um, and it was quick to do. So, what we did is we uh, contacted Thermos, who used the To the Rescue art. They, yep. cre they commissioned and created the To the Rescue art. And then I went and approached Ron and said, We need another poster to go in here. Would you be interested? And I'm imagining he got, you got paid freelance for that. I don't know. <laughs> no bonus money. <laughs> he remembers that detail. He should have been. Back pay. Um, so one thing I want to say about that, I contacted the Aladdin company and, the, and Thermos to try to determine who did that painting. And I know to the rescue, stayed at Hasbro for decades since because people have reported seeing it. Daryl, I think, have you seen it? To the rescue. Jasmine uh, right there. No, no, no. The, the one that they used for the 83 catalog. Yeah, I think so. And then, so there was that to the rescue, and then there was the lunchbox that had six original illustrations. Every right. side of this lunchbox had, had original illustrations, and they were never used anywhere else. They're absolutely beautiful. So to this day, I'm kind of on a mission to find out who painted those two things. I'm certain it's the same person. A lot of people speculated it was Bill Sinkovich, the comic book artist that right. did Daredevil and Elektra and that kind of stuff. And I've talked to him on Facebook, and he, while he loves it, it's not his. Mm -hmm. So we're still on a mission to figure out who painted that. So... 
Any insight from anybody would be great. Um, yeah, go ahead. Now, I have some gentleman who finished the painting. Originally, what I've been told is if someone who had asked to be put on it, you know, wanted to work on the poster, and they were getting married around that time too. So I think they got wrapped up in the marriage stuff and getting the wedding ready, you know, ready. So he wasn't able to finish it on time to where this individual went in and touched it up, tried to match his style and finished it up. But he doesn't recall who it is. That would be to the rescue? Yes. Okay, but so, and Kirk was saying that uh, Thermos had hired a contractor to do that. Okay. Yeah, so, that wasn't an artist we used. Okay, so th this is how things go. 30, 40 years later, you're going to hear different stories. If you start like historically trying to track things down, nail things down, there's going to be different memories and recollections, and that's okay. It doesn't mean anybody's you know blowing smoke. It just they're thirty year old memories. So this is some close ups from the Stars and Stripes Forever, and it's an absolutely beautiful painting. Uh, you guys should check it out. This is a piece you worked on that I don't think you've ever talked about. Operation Outer Space. Space. So, how did you end up drawing that whole book? I don't, I don't really, no. I think that was a freelance job. Actually. Okay. And, uh, so, this is one of those that came with a cassette. You'd put the cassette in, you'd read along and listen to the audio performance. And I, mean, I recognized it right away as soon as I saw it. But yeah. I don't recall it. So the main thing that I wanted people to take away from this panel, this presentation today, is that, yeah, you did the figures, but you also did the insignias, you also did the sigils, you did the vehicles, you did the decal sheets, you did the paintings, you did a book. Uh, it was incredible how productive Ron Rudat was during his tenure on A Real American Hero. I just like to work, I like to do work, and I would just sit at my, in my office all day long, and I would just draw and draw and draw. You know, I mean, the people, other people would be socializing around the department, I wasn't a socializer. I'd rather be in my office and work. Yeah. And so, it just cranked out a lot of work. And, There's and nobody better at it than him. And it shows um, from the legacy of what you left behind. Um, okay, so at 86, you took a little break from G.I. Joe. You wanted to work on some other brands. I felt I had a more of an imagination to work on other products than G.I. Joe. Right. I mean, you could tell when I was getting towards the end, my little tenure with Joe, and I, I started experimenting with drawing, drawing, and yeah, they got more like this. This wasn't his typical presentation art style. This is towards the end. He's like, oh, I'm gonna make it bubbly, more cartoony, yeah. and, and uh, that's that's not a pencil in prism color. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did want to touch on a, a couple other aspects quickly. Um, you have a military connection. Is it your father that served in the Marine Corps? My dad was in the Marine Corps in World War II yeah. in the artillery unit uh, in Okinawa. And so, uh, and so Ron had a proclivity for designing Marines, right? I love the Marines, you know. Uh, my, my father's brother was a Marine for 20 years. And uh, I just always liked Marines, so I, I put Three Marines and the Joe Line. Yeah. I also noticed when Ron was on the line, we got women. When Ron left the line, <laughs> we didn't get ladies for several years. <laughs> so if you think about it, 82 Scarlet, 83 Cover Girl, 84 Baroness, yeah. 85 Lady J, 86 Zorana, 87 Jinx, yeah. and then Ron left the line. And then we didn't get anybody I, until I think Scarlet. Kirk would, would also say, if, yeah, we, we try to put a girl in there because there are girls that like G.I. Joe. Of course. So we put those girls in there. Yep. You know, Scarlet was the first. We appreciated it. And the favorite. There was always really good, was right out of the gate, G.I. Joe had good representation across all spectrums. Um, so I was going to go through a couple things that we kind of uncovered while. We had our talks back in the day. One of the things is that Bazooka is based on Steve Grogan uh, because, you know, these guys are from the New England area and they're unapologetic Patriots fans. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the bat, he wasn't a battle android trooper to start with. He's a bionic trooper and there's a fleshy arm right there. And if you look at the card art for the bat, there's actually some flesh tones in the card art. So I think some of that made it in before it became a just full-blown android. I think they made it a full-blown android, so Sergeant Slaughter would have something to rip up in the cartoons, but <laughs> that's purely speculation. Yeah, the, um, uh, I've been telling a lot of people, too, that you know the chess piece that goes on the bat? Yep. Um, I built that chess piece out uh, of tubing and whatever, and painted it and everything. Yep. I hand-carried that down to Texas, right. but they made a lenticular label that you see on the, on the figures today. 
and the guy that owned the place gave you his car keys and let you go oh, for a drive. The woman who owned the place. Woman who owned the place. They gave her car. They go for a ride and come back later. Yeah, I don't know where to go. Down the street and came back. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Ron has been gracious enough to share hours of interviews with me, and they're all on like the corresponding character page on 3D Joe's. So if you go to the back page, you'll hear that story. Uh, just scroll to the bottom for creator commentary. Um, all right, so this is something I wanted to ask you about, and Kirk, I'm glad you're here. Maybe you can answer as well. So this artwork is a lot more risque than this artwork. She's got the uncovered shoulders. She's got the dragon tattoos. Arana was the original girl with the dragon tattoo. Um, she's got a lower cut blouse. I'm just going to be honest here and call it out. Um, so the blouse has been brought up. There's an additional flap on the blouse. There's shoulder armor. The dragon tattoo is gone. And the pants that were ripped were originally flesh color. Now the pants that are ripped has some pink leggings coloring all that flesh. So, covering all that flesh. So something happened here where we're like, whoa, 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 we got to tone it down with the random. <laughs> Do you guys have any recollection of that? That's not mine. Look at me. Beyond your pay grade. Cough it up, Kirk. What do you got? Don't look at me. Look at my boss. <laughs> <laughs> this was the second time. So originally, uh, the Baroness was, uh, let's just say she was sculpted a little different. She was better in doubt, yes. and they, they had to go down and, and sand her down a little bit. So this is the second example of a lady with G.I. Joe being kind of toned down a little bit. I, I totally understand the shoulder armor because that uh, lets you know that, oh, they're probably kin to Zartan who had come out uh, two years earlier at that point. So they basically just took the upper arms from Zartan and put it on Xandar and Zorana. Part of that had to do with the plastic they're using too. So like my book, I talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. the color changing, all that, the type of material they're using. No problem. So, um, I don't remember all the details, but I did talk about in the book where, you know, engineering, I believe, came in and were like, hey, you need to, you can't have that flush tone here yeah. for her upper arms. So. so, those three figures, Zartan, Zorana, Xandar, they all had color change technology, so their skin would go from light color to dark color when you put it in sunlight, but so as, as Dan's just shed light on, that meant that they needed to use thicker Zartans too. The original Zartans, when the original Zartan had sleeveless bare shoulders as well. Cool. So yeah, this was a uh, this was interesting to find. This actually made it out into the 1988 International Licensing Guide. The line art made it out into that guide, and this artwork made it out into the Live the Adventure board game that I believe was released in '86 along with Zorana. So it went far along the process before they decided to tone it down. Um, yeah, I love Falcon, so I just thought I'd share him. That. <laughs> um, but that's Ron Rudat, uh, presentation art for a 1987 character. So that just goes to show like he's still creating presentation art that far down his tenure. That'd be an in-house presentation art. In-house presentation art, right. Um, here's Kirk as Law, and it's that more cartoony kind of yeah. style. And uh, there's Tunnel Rat. Uh, as you guys know, that's based on Larry Hamlin. Uh, the likeness of the portrait that's on the card art is based on Larry Hamlin. And this was a, uh, was this Pythona? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a concept for Pythona. Obviously that changed a little bit, but a lot of her look looks very similar to Sepintor. Uh, so this was interesting. We were sitting in his uh, studio talking about different characters and trying to recall where they came from. He recalled a movie. He wasn't sure what movie it was, but there was something in a cavern where there was this guy and he had some spikes on and he was chasing people around because like a worm was in his ear. Beast Master. Yeah. Beast Master. Beast Master. Beast Master. But that's kind of how he recalled it to me. Yeah. So I went home and was listening to that and started searching and I found the Beastmaster guy. <laughs> so I didn't know if you'd seen him since like 1983 or four. <laughs> I thought he had more. Does he still scare you? <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's always fun to try to connect the dots and see where these ideas came from. And so yeah. the Beastmaster thing was fun. Yeah, a lot of my ideas came from, from some movies that I've seen or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, I know he left the line for a while, went to work on other books. <coughs> That's Spielberg. Stayed with uh, stayed with Hasbro until 1999, right? Yeah. Yep. So he was still with Hasbro until 1999. He came back and worked on the Joe line pretty heavily in 1994. We've got a few examples here. Um, this was the Cobra Commander from 1994 Star Brigade line art, uh, as well as effects. This is a color study. So this is kind of that polished sketch art with the color markers put in on top of it. So that's effects. And the sculpt actually looks like that. He's an angry guy. Um, and then, let's see, this is Space Shot. And that's the one that's like all white, kind of looks like a Clark Gable of space kind of guy. 
And uh, yeah, so uh, shameless plug, Ron's given us hours of interviews. They're all on 3D Joe's. You can go to the, under the Creators tab, click on Ron Rudat. You can listen to hours of interviews, or if you go to specific character pages, you can hear those audio interviews on those. Uh, Dan's got a series of books that's all about the pre-production stuff, so if you guys want to learn about the process, check Dan's books out. And uh, other than that, we had some uh, Triple T stuff. That's a Triple T. I have a, I have a drawing of the Triple T in my portfolio. And this would show you the iterative process that Ron used for the Triple T as well. So we've got like eight drawings here. They're all pretty different. This is like a chicken walker, like the at at from Star Wars. Yeah. What I was trying to do with that was uh, like take, a, take an engine from an aircraft uh, and you know, plop a seat inside of it. And everything. You know, this would be what I was trying to do. It's, even put in these sound effects here. So he had some fun with it. I think the hovercraft one even in there. Yep. And here's a hovercraft one with no wheels. So trying some different things out. And then this one with just gigantic tractor tires, kind of really bringing out the country. This is like, I think this is a nod to North Carolina, maybe. A nod to North Carolina. He lives in North Carolina. Tractor tires. All right, and then this one got a lot closer to obviously what, what we ended up with. So in the original presentation art for the Triple T is actually green. So it was originally done in green, and okay. later changed to white. So, yeah. um, so this is the tarantula as well. This looks like it's a chalk on yeah, the structure paper. Yeah, this trade was an idea for a vehicle. But it's almost like presentation art. Like it yeah. went, it went quite a ways. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, the color of Yeah, yeah, it went with presentation. It's one of them produced the pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Is. And so after Real American Hero, Ron went in to do, went on to do more art for GI Joe. This was a 12-inch series, right? Yeah. So he continued to create illustrations for the brand well after Real American Hero concluded. So. Uh, yeah, I shot these at your house. So I, I just wanted to say, uh, I hope you guys have a better appreciation for the, the broad spectrum of stuff that Ron worked on while he's at G.I. Joe. Yes, he did every figure, but he also did a ton of vehicles. He also did decals, he did books, he did posters, weapons, weapons accessories. He touched on so much stuff. We all, as collectors that have been obsessed with this stuff for decades, owe him so much. So just go by and say thank you, because it does matter. And uh, have a look at the stuff that he brought along with him. Just, just real quick before we go, what is your favorite figure? Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> every single person asks me that. Yeah. What is your favorite? It changes every time. I don't have any favorite figure except me. I a couple of figures I do like. Scarlet has always been one of my favorites. And recently it's been uh, Vipers. 86. Yeah, from Vipers. Yeah. So do you have enough of those on that? I, I got 40. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been fun. Ron's been collecting a lot lately. He's been on the boards with everybody, and uh, yeah. it's, it's fun to interact with them. Yeah, except the figures are getting way too expensive for me. They are. Everything's yeah. getting way too expensive for the influx of new fans, but I'm holding on. Hey. We're, glad, we're glad that people are coming on. Let's do a quick Q&A. I saw him over here first. Just one question. Y'all said you had to present these drawings to Toys R Us and never be kept were y'all ever rejected and told to go change something or couldn't no. sell something? No, not from, not from the customer. No. All right. I'll we got rejected a lot by our senior management, <laughs> but not, not by any customer. I'm just going to say, you know, I know there's uh, a lot of new people here, I guess, but, uh, you know, they didn't really touch on it, but Leatherneck's likeness was based on Rob Thank you. and Dustin used his file name. Yeah, so Dusty's file card uh, is Tador, and that's Rudap backwards. Um, in the episode of the cartoon where uh, Dusty was a traitor, they said it wrong and said Rudap. Yeah. They said it correctly. <laughs> um, but Leatherneck, the, the portrait, his likeness was painted as Leatherneck, Leatherneck on that card art. And that makes sense because it's the Marine character and the love for the Marines. So uh, who else has a quick question? Paige? Are yours and Dan's books available for sale? Yeah, I, I didn't pay you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've literally got 38 full sets of uh, collecting the art of G.I. Joe, which is every painting from 82 to 94, so come by and see me if you're interested in that. And then, uh, yeah, Dan's still selling his books. Yeah, I have still um, a few sets available here. So I have all six volumes here with me, so you know, feel free to come by, and then I'll have this as well if you want to see up close what's on the detail that's put into this stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, like you said earlier. Um, 
the amount of detail that these guys put in for, for the Joe by hand is amazing to what you know they can do nowadays, you know, computer and stuff like that. So um, and then as far as research too, I mean you think well now you can Google something in a matter of minutes and find a tripwire images of a yeah. you know mine. The amount, the amount of the research that goes into all this stuff, it, back then it was pretty amazing because we went to Native Army Labs. We saw what the uh, they were doing for the Army. The helmets that they wear today, I got to wear before the soldier got to wear. Um, saw uniforms that you know, weren't even in existence yet. They do sea crash. Air pads. We've gone to Twanset Naval Base, which was down in Rhode Island, to look at an aircraft carrier. You know, our Otis Air Force base to look at F 14s. You know, so there was a lot of research on our part. The guys had to work on, uh, work on it in the uh, late 90s, uh, not late 90s, but uh, 2000s. They weren't doing that either. They had it easy. They, had to be, they were doing uh, all their fantasy stuff. So, so we did uh, a lot of research. So go to Dan's booth, go to Ron's booth. If you want to see hard copies, physical copies, go visit Jody Classified. All three of those booths have a wealth of information. It's past four o'clock, so I got to be respectful of the next presenter, right?